in addition to our marvelous uh, steamboat water back there, I just drew a jug of lithia water from the lithia spring. So I hope you all get a chance to sample it. For those who aren't accustomed to the taste, I put some lime back there. Uh, so <laughs> it, uh, it's the way I drink it in the, in the morning with a, a half a lime. But it's, it's very good when it's fresh. There's a, uh, since it isn't chilled, there's a slight sulfurous odor, which some of you have noticed already when you came into the room. Oh, I'll tell you about that. <laughs> um, I gave a, a lecture here at the museum about, uh, oh, eight, ten years ago on the springs, and it was just when the museum was starting their outreach programs, when they started having special events besides just the museum exhibits. And at that time, I was very, very concerned about the springs of Steamboat. Uh, they had fallen into disuse. Uh, the Lithia Spring was a garbage dump. Uh, the, uh, several of the other springs nearby, the Navajo Spring, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, no-name spring had all disappeared because uh, with the construction and a lot of building and road cuts uh, coming around, a lot of the springs dry up. I'm happy to say that in the interim, in the last Eight, eight years, the uh, Lithia Spring Park has been restored primarily through the efforts of Suzanne Golub. She just kept after the city council for years and years and years, and finally they restored the Lithia Spring and restored the breastwork outside. They restored the Iron Spring, and I'll mention about the Soda Spring in, uh, a little bit later. Um, I'm not saying the parks are as well maintained as, as I'd like them to be, but uh, the Lithia Spring Park now is maintained by one of the uh, nursery schools. And it's, it's just been, uh, the grass is cut and the trees are planted and it looks uh, like a million dollars and I just came from there. One of the other things I did to kind of resuscitate the springs was to prevail upon uh, the city parks and recreation to start a springs walking tour and i've given some of you a brochure that you can get pick up at just about any place where they have brochures that lists this springs walking tour and the city has made it possible by building footbridges from uh, the lithia spring over to uh, behind howelson hill and so you can get to the sulfur cave and then back to the to the heart spring, which is number one on this. And I'll go through each of these. At the site of each of these springs, you will find a little placard that lists a lot of the information that's on here. The flow, chemical composition, temperature, uh, generally what its medic medicinal qualities are, uh, kind of just general information. So when you, it's a self-guided tour. Although I understand from several people who've talked to me this spring that they are having guided tours. I think uh, at certain times they have volunteers who guide people around the various springs and ex explain a lot to them. Uh, the history of Steamboat is really the, the history of, of the springs of Steamboat. This area was known as the Medicine Springs to the Utes, the Yampatika Utes, who came here as the earliest reference I found was 1300. But I think it's folly to say that they came here first in 1300. Obviously, uh, that's, that's because of the date of the Fremont Indians. But obviously, the Anasazi were here, and Indian tribes have migrated here since man has been present in the, on, on this continent. And I'm certain that, uh, as in all places around the world where there are hot springs and medicinal springs that the indigenous people enjoyed them and used them for religious purposes, for health purposes, for recreation. The earliest record we have, I think, uh, that we've seen mention of the steamboat springs was 1839. I think most of you are familiar with the, the origin of steamboat's name. Uh, across from the library on the other side, before they built the railroad, was the Steamboat Spring. 
Now, obviously, steamboats didn't come in until the 19th century, so the name was given sometime during the 19th century. There are a lot of uh, various tales, mythic tales, of how it got its name. I like the one about the French trappers coming along, trapping beaver, and one says, voila, c'est un steamboat, and uh, the name stuck. Uh, whatever it is, somebody named it steamboat, and obviously it was uh, somebody who knew about steamboats because the spring on the other side of the river made a chugging noise, and uh, from uh, what I can remember, or uh, from what I've read, this uh, geyser went eight to ten feet high, kind of like uh, some of the springs in Yellowstone. And it went, built up gas, and then it went up and made a chugging noise. So people who camped nearby thought uh, they had uh, reached a navigable river that went to the Pacific, and uh, uh, we were tied into the, uh, more than the western slope. Um, in 1815, and I'm not sure of the date, I've seen two references, 1815, 1820, the last recorded battle of the Utes occurred on Snake Island, right across from the pool, the town pool. And up above the pool is a hill. It's all now uh, enclosed in a, in a chain link fence. And the Arapahoes were encamped on, on Snake Island. And the Ute hunting party, which came here every summer, uh, was here hunting and bathing in the springs. And this battle lasted three days. And Yarmouni, who was the chief, I know the Utes don't really call them chiefs, the tribal leader at that time, was killed. And his son uh, buried him on that hill behind the, the uh, recreation pool, Steamboat's town, town Pool. And there are quite a few graves up there. Gordy Wren has told me that when he was a boy, he used to go up there hunting arrowheads, and he always found some. We had a lot of people hunting around there when the word got out that that was a burial uh, place. So the uh, health and recreation of, I'm on their board, we, we took it, we got the land from the city and put it a fence around it so that we would keep uh, grave diggers out. So you're welcome to go up there and wander around, but don't bring a shovel with you. Uh, apparently there was another battle between the Utes and the Arapaho, and that is uh, near where Steamboat Cemetery is. Uh, people tell of finding arrowheads up the cemetery road, which is, is just west of town. Uh, when James Crawford came to Steamboat in 1875, uh, he staked his claim right next to the Steamboat Springs on an aspen tree. At that time, you carve the side of the tree and write your name on it, and that gives you your claim. At the time, he mentions finding an encampment in the city park of between five and 600 Yampatika Utes, and they were here hunting. They went down to the lower country around Rifle and Meeker in the wintertime, but they hunted here, bathed here uh, all during the summer. This was their, their favorite place. These are the White River Utes. By 10 years later, we have a photo of a bathhouse built over the Heart Spring by the Crawford family. And it's a wooden bathhouse, and they bathe there regularly in the hot springs, in which you probably, many of us, still bathe uh, daily. And it's the same water pouring out. And they used to empty the water, but they had a sluice and a kind of a, like a, uh, like an irrigation ditch, and they, the last person after they'd bathe, they'd pull that up, and then the water would go on into the river, just as it does now. And I've read some other early references where the creek that flows between the post office and the pool at one time was routed into the heart spring. It's since been diverted, but I suppose it was to cool it down. Um, by 1911, there was a huge pool here, and you'll find pictures in the museum of that pool, both a, a hot pool, which was enclosed inside, and a large outdoor pool. And this uh, configuration, it was the town pool, lasted really until about the, the 60s. Uh, we came here in the late 50s, and at that time, the original configuration still existed. 
and there was this large outside pool and the dimensions were uh, 110 by 190 and it was nine feet deep, bigger than the present pool. The indoor pool was 75 feet long and was 95 degrees, a little bit cooler than the present hot, hot pool, but it was much bigger. And all the showers were the hot water. There was no city water into that at all. The showers just ran continually. Of course, they, they mineralized up quite frequently. And they also had 10 private pools. And Annabeth, you remember those. Um, Marion and I would rent one on Saturday night, and you would you'd get the key, and they had a sand bottom, and they were all wood, and they were, you'd step down in it. And they were family bathing pools. And they were really nice. I, I kind of wish we had something like that now. As I indicated at the beginning, the spring waters were not just for bathing. They also have a lot of health properties. Um, one of the early 1911 promotional brochures, and this was a promotion to uh, get funding for a sanitarium in Steamboat Springs. And uh, this 1911 brochure reads, uh, the waters of Steamboat are recommended for catarrh, rheumatism, eczema, anemia, and all forms of stomach, bla stomach, blood, kidney, and bladder troubles. <laughs> so if you can't find what ails you there. Uh, in 1909, a large hotel was built right where the library sits now. It's called the Cabin Hotel. And the reason it was built there was because it was opposite the Soda Spring. The Soda Spring was the most delicious spring. I mean, if, if the Soda Spring still flowed, uh, it would be one of the prime bottled waters that we could find anywhere, I mean, with rival Perrier or any of the Calistoga waters. It didn't have sulfur in it, and it was effervescent. As a matter of fact, um, I can remember when we came here, they had a cup tied to the little gazebo. And you, everybody just dipped that cup in, and uh, you drank. Uh, all the tourists, when they came through town, would stop at the little gazebo and drink this, this soda spring water and fill up their jugs. People would drive from Craig and all over to get the, the, uh, the soda, soda spring water. Um, one of the principal kind of proponents of the health quality, uh, the health properties of Steamboat Springs was uh, the elder William H. Gossert, or H.W. Gossert. And I remember him. He was still alive when we came to Steamboat. He died, I think, in 1965 at the age of 94. And he was a tall, white-haired man, very erect. And he was the one, really, who started me on drinking lithia daily, which I still do. And uh, he, had, he would go to California for the winters, and he had the trunk of his car lined with stainless steel, and he had a faucet on it. <laughs> and it was, it, uh, he would fill it with lithia water so he wouldn't be without his daily dose. So you don't know what you're missing if you don't try it today. <laughs> It uh, kind of reminded me, we, uh, went, we made a trip, to, uh, Marion and I made a trip to India this uh, winter, and we ran across the, uh, the, the uh, Sultan of Gwalior who went to uh, Queen Victoria's uh, Golden uh, Jubilee in London. And he was so afraid of being without his Ganges water, he had this huge silver tank uh, built and then transported to the ship and he took it with him to London and it's on, dis on display at London because he, he felt he just couldn't be without the, the, the water of the, of the Holy Ganges River. And Bill Gossard kind of reminded me of that. Bill Gossard got a, uh, he so believed in the health properties of Steamboat Springs, a man before his time, he got a lease of the springs, all the springs from the city. The city still owns the springs. From 1931 to 1935, he leased the town pool. And there he had a concessionaire, and I, I ran across his name. It was kind of interesting. Ray Wood. And Ray Wood was a high diver. And they built a 100-foot tower 
into the pool, the t where the town pool, and they would have shows, and Ray Wood would dive into the town pool from this 100-foot tower. And uh, Ray Wood's wife and mother ran the concession stand and sold the tickets. And it, was a, it was a real uh, kind of a water circus. It was nine feet deep. <laughs> um, so um, in 1935, Bill Gossard gave up his lease on the, on the Heart Spring, which is our swimming pool. And the Steamboat Health and Recreation Association was formed, and it's been in existence ever since. So it's one of the longest lived institutions, a nonprofit organization. We're all volunteers. And, and uh, it's just, it serves as, as the pool of steamboat. That's the only public pool we have. And uh, all the children get their swim lessons there. And they have, this morning there were kayakers in there. They used to, at spring carnival, build us a, a snow ramp. And skiers would do their flips and go into the pool, but the liability got too great, and so we've, we've cut that out. Uh, old Mr. Gossard uh, formed a corporation, and it was called the Steamboat Springs Miraquel Corporation. Miraquel means, uh, quelle is spring in German, so this was miracle waters, miracle springs. And his plan was to bottle the lithia water and to sell it because that was his favorite. And if you go up there, and when you start, I'll walk you around uh, here in the room on the, on the Springs tour, you'll see the breastwork. Part of the restoration of the park is the breastwork has, has been restored. And by that, I mean the stone towers. And if you look closely, the crest has a G on it. He was not that modest, I guess. So. <laughs> and he had uniformed guards in those guard houses there. So when you went up to fill your jug, he, they handed out promotional literature, and, and uh, it was uh, quite, a, quite a promotion. Uh, the, um, as I mentioned, the, the uh, city still owns the springs. And during about 10 years ago, which I consider the low point of the springs, I, don't, I think there are probably only a half a dozen of us drinking that water. And somebody filed on the water. Colorado has funny water laws. And water that isn't used for a certain period of time, you lose it. Use it or lose it. So I had to go to district court with Tom Sharp, the uh, city attorney, and uh, testify that I had been a, a habitual user <laughs> in order for the city to retain its water rights over the, over the Lithia Spring. You had to show conti uh, continual use because somebody else wanted to get a lease on it and bottle it. And that may happen sometime. Um, another great proponent of Steamboat Springs was Dorothy Wither. She was a fellow member on the board of the Health and Recreation Association, which is the name of the pool board there. Dorothy Wither died in 1989, and we made a Dorothy Wither Memorial Park in the back of where the pool is. And for the first time, you were able, part of this reconstruction of the building of the park, you are able now physically to bathe in the Heart Spring. That was never, for the last 50 years, wasn't possible, except for high school kids who would come in in the nude at night and jump over the fence. But now, where you bathe in the Heart Spring, the, the highest, where it comes out of the ground, that was renovated in, in 1989. And I'll read the dedication, which I wrote for Dorothy, um, because on the morning she died, we all swam together, and she just went home and died, and that's the way she wanted it. Uh, so this park is, this was in 1989. This park is dedicated to Dorothy Wither, uh, 1903 to 1987. She died two years before. The first lady of Steamboat Springs, who enriched and preserved the history of the community, community in which she was born. Dorothy enjoyed the soothing waters of this mineral spring from the time the first bathhouse was built in 1909 until her death at age 84. Dorothy's father, Archie Wither, a native of Scotland, arrived in Steamboat Springs on a freight wagon on the 4th of July, 1889. He homesteaded Emerald Mountain across the Yampa River behind the present-day 90-meter ski jump on Howelson Hill. 
A true pioneer, Dorothy embodied the character and strength of the settlers of Yampa Valley. She loved and enjoyed its natural beauty and above all, the waters of this heart spring. And we had a dedication and that, I read that just to give you a little background of one of the early pioneers who, have, who enjoyed the springs all, all her life. And I used to alternate, I'd fill her jugs uh, every other day and she'd fill mine when she would go down. Um, one of the kind of unfortunate, well let's, yeah, okay, Heart Spring is on our tour if you have this. I've talked a lot about it, is the spring that is part of the pool. And that is the one where people bathe, and it's the source, and it flows in, flows from the out of the out of the earth into a massage pool, into another hot pool, and then into a lap pool, and then into the river, which is kind of nice because that's where it originally went anyhow. So the you'll see people in that little river park down there bathing where the hot water comes out because even in the winter you see the steam come up and it's kind of nice as it goes in, into the pool out there. Uh, the second spring on the, on the number two, if you have your little map, is the Iron Spring. And that Iron Spring is just across from the library on the hill over there. And that Iron Spring is, was the closest spring to um, really the Crawford Spring, just behind where Brad Rutledge's office is, just up, as you're going up towards the college on the left, there's a little house with uh, architect and Brad Rutledge. Right in the back there is the Crawford Spring, and that is the location uh, of the original Crawford Cabin. And one of the descendants of James Crawford was Lolita Crawford Pritchett, who wrote a delightful little book. It's out of print, and the museum's trying to get that printed again. It's called The Cabinet Medicine Springs. And it's a delightful book. My daughter, who teaches fourth grade, reads this to her class. And the little, the area is right over here, just below the college, just behind Sweet Pea over there. And I'll just read you the one chapter, it says. The Metcalfs had brought two wonderful things from outside. The first was a package of oatmeal. Though Ma often cooked cornmeal mush and sometimes made gruel out of coarse graham flour, oatmeal was a delicacy the family had never tried. The other wonderful thing was a bag of lemons. Ordinary lemonade was delicious, but lemonade with iron, but lemonade made with iron spring water was the finest thing any of them had ever tasted. The trick was to mix the juice of half a lemon, a big tablespoon of sugar in the bottom of a cup, and stir it while someone poured in the fresh iron water. The drink would fizz and run over the top unless a person drank it fast. Though the lemons were soon gone, iron water was pretty good by itself, and there was always plenty of it. Bubbling up in the center of the rush-covered mound, it must have been bubbling there for centuries, because all around it, the mud was thick, rusty yellow. And then, uh, this is a true story, a biography. Uh, she mentions playing with her doll in a little cave, and you can still see the cave up above that spring. And it's, uh, it's a delightful thing. And an Indian, of course, a Ute Indian was up there and talked to her and befriended her. So it's a marvelous little book, and I, I hope the museum can get it printed again. So that is the Iron Spring. If you walk up there, it's covered with a lot of funky looking stuff, but if you skim off the other, the, the top, it's still a very delicious spring. And there isn't, for those of you who don't like sulfur, there is not much sulfur in it. It's, quite, it's still quite delicious. Uh, going to number three was the soda spring, and that's an unfortunate tale. <laughs> Ten years ago, they widened the highway, and they moved the gazebo, which is across from the library, and they lost the spring. It won't hurt to move. Spring, city officials say. And uh, this is from the pilot. I've 
have a whole file of these things. Many long-term residents of Steamboat Springs who have drank from the numerous area springs consider Soda Spring to be the best tasting. They and other residents are concerned that Soda Spring will be ruined during construction, recalling how the Steamboat Spring lost its chugging sound when a railroad crew blasted in the area. Don Combs, who worked for the Highway Department for many years and wrote the original environmental impact statement for this widening project in 74, recalls sending a gallon of the Soda Spring water to a Denver dentist every week as a kid in the 1930s, earning 25 cents each time. The dentist didn't use it on his patients, he just liked the taste. The spring had a much heavier flow back then, he recalls, running off into the Yampa River. Margaret Herbert, a third generation native, says she has made lemonade from the spring water all her life to add fizz to the drink. She recalls how popular this was in the early part of the century when there was no such thing as soda pop. Although the spring has lost some of its bubble, she says it still has a sparkly lemon taste that makes you belch. <laughs> Gloria Gossard remembers when people regularly took the soda spring water over to the cabin hotel, where the library is now, to add a squeezed lemon. Soda spring to be moved. It says, whether the effect of the new location will be the same as same has yet to be to determined. Critics of the move claim the spring was lo will lose its bubbling clarity after it is piped several hundred feet. Madsen notes that a design for the relocation procedure is currently being developed. Hopefully the project will be carried out without the use of dynamite. Dynamite's death on springs. History buffs remember what happened to the famed Steamboat Spring, which featured a six to eight foot periodic geyser when railroad crews blasted in the early part of the century. The mistake cost Steamboat the only geyser in Colorado and millions of dollars in lost tourist revenues over the decades. Now these articles were January 1988. The spring is dead. The gazebo's there, it's nice and there's no water in it. So the tastiest spring in Steamboat is just a memory. You find, find that, that's number three, the gazebo. Just down uh, from uh, the soda spring is still a very lively one. It's the one you smell usually. It's the sulfur spring. And animals love the sulfur spring. And if you go down, you walk down towards the river from the soda spring. And as you go down there, if you examine the old original stonework around, you'll find several rings where people used to tie their horses because the horses love the sulfur water. And that's still there. And a lot of times, if you're ever up early in the morning, you'll find deer and other animals drinking from that sulfur spring. It's pretty smelly, but animals just love it and crave it. Uh, wild animals, domestic animals, and so forth. There was another spring that was lost, and that was the sweet spring. It comes up now in the middle of the lake out there. Uh, supposedly, th this was all done when they made the highway four lanes out there, and the, supposedly they had the technology to get rid of it, but uh, I, I'm always amused each spring when that whole hillside gets pregnant over there and just <laughs> swells up like this and then pretty soon it slides down on the highway. So much for their technology. <laughs> but it bubbles up, it's lost. You've got a lake there, but uh, as far as uh, utilizing it, except for kayaking, it's, it's a little difficult. As you cross the bridge, you come to the Steamboat Springs, just on the other side. Now they've made that very accessible with two walking lanes. You can cross the bridge on either side now. That's just been opened. And the first one you come to is the Black Sulphur Spring. And that's an interesting one. It was used to be called the Ink Spring. And it really looks vile. But it's, uh, it's very, it's, uh, a lot of people believe that it's good for skin diseases. And just down uh, about oh, 20 or 30 feet is a terrace spring. It's, that's the name of the Terra Spring, and it flows into the river. And the Indians uh, used to take the, the, uh, the, the stuff, the, the stuff that leaches out of the water, the white kind of creamy stuff, and spread it all over themselves. And I was down there, it's been a couple of years ago, and there was a ranch family, about six people from Wyoming. And they all had come down, and, and she says she had come down for years and spread this on her skin. So she had some sort of skin disease. But she says, oh, it just gave her perfect relief. 
And you can see it on, it's white and black, and I mean, it's kind of messy, but it's, uh, it's still a, a very useful spring. Can you find that? There are three springs down there. There's, a, there's the black sulfur, the steamboat, and then the terrace spring. It was right next to that black sulfur spring that in 1874 James Crawford laid his claim to let the first land in in Steamboat Springs. Um, I've mentioned quite a bit about the Lithia Spring, and it's in marvelous shape. There were three other springs over in a field near where the uh, um, bus garage is, but they've been lost. They're dried up completely. There's one that is still flowing, but it flows into the ditch up in the residential area, but how long that'll flow, I, I really don't know. What happens is that as you make a road cut, it just disturbs the spring, and then it goes off another way, and it's lost. You don't, you don't find it after that. I should mention uh, one other spring that isn't in the city. It's one that the Parks and Rec used to own, and that's Strawberry Park Hot Springs, which is really a, a wonder of the world. If that were located anywhere else in the world, there'd be 20 high-rise hotels around it, and you'd have to pay $25 to get in. But it's, it's a marvelous spring, and I think uh, Don has done, uh, Don Johnson, who uh, bought it from the Health and Rec. The Health and Rec had to sell it because we, could, we didn't have enough money to keep guards up there, and people were camping and ruining, and uh, the health department threatened to close it down completely. So it's in private hands now, but it is, it is a, a, wondrous, a wondrous spring. And that's way up Strawberry Park. You have to drive up. At the end, you go as far as you can go, and it, it's nice up there. They have uh, they built some cabins, and it's it's uh, they have a uh, um, massage therapist up there, and it's it's really done done quite quite well. The last spring, number seven, is the Sulphur Cave, and that's the most mysterious of the springs, and it's the one you can't partake in. The fire department tests their their uh, poison gas gear by going in there and see how long they can stand. There are all kinds of stories about people passing out there. And, uh, it's a very mysterious, it's a, it's a sulfur spring. And uh, the legend has it that the Indians used it for, ver for various rituals. Indians would go in and they couldn't stand it anymore and they hallucinate. Very much like the Oracle at Delphi. If any of you have been to Greece, the Oracle at Delphi bubbles up, it's noxious, and the Oracle, who was always a woman, would put her head in there and breathe deeply. They had to replace the Oracle about every 30 days because it <laughs> killed her. But she had, she had visions that, that sustained the Western world for a thousand years. Um, generally, when you find mysterious caves like that, uh, it kind of is a contact to the supernatural. A lot of people feel that this is where you get off. I, uh, this was all before drugs, of course. But <laughs> How many springs are there? Uh, the literature says 150. I doubt whether there are anywhere near that now. I, it's gone down to probably 75 or 80 springs. And... Uh, Right, right now, the ones that are listed on here are about the only ones that are being looked after. And it will only be a matter of time, and I really had a concern 10 years ago whether these would be looked after. I mean, it would be a true embarrassment to live here and have a town steamboat springs and not have any springs left. Um, even the Ski Corp, in all their promotional brochures, and I, I, this rang a bell with me, they never mentioned that there were any springs in steamboat. This was 10 years ago. Now, in the summer bulletin, they do mention the springs. 
And the museum, the historical guide, I wrote the chapter on the springs, which is, I think, being reprinted. It, the last edition was in 79, and about two years ago, I updated the chapter on, on the springs of Steamboat, largely with what I'm telling you uh, today. Um, springs are, are really the circulatory system of the earth. When the springs stop and the water start, stops being live and moving around from 3,000 deep inside that Hans Peak volcano, uh, it means something's wrong with the earth. And when you dump a lot of junk down into the springs or in our, our water aquifers, as they're finding, out with, finding now with the Ogallala Aquifer, um, it's, life itself is threatened. You can't grow crops. So unless you keep the, the waters healthy, the waters circulating, and keep them free from pollution and so forth, there's hardly any, there's, it's, a, it's a threat to human life. Um, now, wherever anybody constructs anything, like even up at the college, they find a spring and it's just a nightmare. They want to get rid of it, want to bury it, want to pipe it off somewhere because it impedes construction and tears up the road and everything. And it's, it's, such, a, it's such a waste. And I, I think it's a very short-term uh, compensation to, to get, rid of the, get rid of the springs. Um, Somebody asked me uh, what the the lithia does for you, you know, and I say I've been drinking it for 40 years, and for me right now, uh, the the springs of steamboat mean more than the skiing, which might be shocking to some of you. But uh, I ski in the winter, ski quite often, but I drink lithia year round. And uh, I enjoy, I, I swim at the, at the pool every morning, as does Annabeth and my wife, and, uh, at 5.30 in the morning. And I tell you, if I don't swim, I really feel, don't feel quite right. You know? So um, I really have a, a kind of a love for the springs. And you, know, you ask, uh, well, do I feel any different from, uh, for drinking? Lithia every day, you know, and I say, well, um, no, but you know, I'm 105 years old, and you never tell. Me. <laughs> I'll end there. And... Afraid to stop now, you know. Okay. How, how much do you drink? How do you drink? I drink about a pint. Okay. I drink about a pint. It's free. It's, it's uh, donations today if you do. <laughs> yes, I squeeze a half a lime or a whole lime, depending on how many we have. Limes are cheap. And it just, it, it, it's effervescent. It fizzes up. You know, it goes into, and I just drink it before breakfast, and I think it's great. Now, how do you acquire it out of the spring? Oh no, the, the lithia spring is has such a flow. I mean, it is, there's a little bit of, of uh, uh, lithia along the side, but just, it flows so much, you just put your jug down in there and it's, it's. Uh, right in the main thing. Right in the main thing. The, 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 the lithia itself is, has just uh, leached out of the water and it's along the side, but you can go like that. But there's such a flow in that. And it remains uh, 72 degrees summer and winter. Uh, I remember um, Carol Gossard telling me years ago, and she used to, as a girl, she used to have to go down and fill her father's jugs, and she in the snow. And she came up, and there's a big snow because the snow melts off. So there's a big high thing. She slides down, and here was a dead horse in it. <laughs> and she clambered, dropped her jug and clambered up the snow, and she said she was terrified. <laughs> yeah. How often do you, do you get it? Oh, about uh, every three, four days. I mean, it's handy. You just go around, and they've, the city, bless them, has, has, has uh, put stuff to keep the dust down on the road, and they plow it, so you can get up there all the time now. Taste it. Yes, there are no two springs alike. Oops. Uh, each spring uh, has its own characteristics, and that depends on the vein 
of rock that it flows through. And water is a, is a marvelous uh, substance, what do, you, what do you call it, Mar marvelous liquid. It either dissolves everything, including glass, or it interacts with that substance. So water takes on its characteristic of the rock it flows through. So each, uh, on the back of this little brochure, you'll find the various springs and, and their analyses, which is rather interesting. Uh, lithia is quite a rare spring. Uh, there's one in Heidelberg, Germany. There's one in Ashland, Oregon. And I'll tell you, if you go to Heidelberg, people are bringing their jugs from all over Europe to fill that. I mean, it is. Um, I started to drink lithia water long before the National Institutes of, of Health uh, did studies and found out it cured manic depression. So it's the same as lithia? Yeah. And uh, a lot of psychologists say, hey, well, you know. <laughs> no, I'm not standing on the ground. Um, a lot of the psychologists say, well, but the lethal dose of lithium is pretty near the fatal uh, the, the fatal dose is pretty soon, I don't know, something. And I say, well, if the Indians have been drinking it for several thousands of years, and, and uh, Mr. Gossard lived to be 94, and I said, I'll take my chances, you know. Oh, yeah. It has a lot of, lot of things. A lot of the old timers really drink it. Go ahead. When you went to India and didn't bring your lithium with you, <laughs> what changes did you notice besides the grouchy headaches? I mean, you know what? Yeah, the Indians got on my nerves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Seemed to be too many of them. <laughs> did, did you notice anything? Well, it's hard to say. You know, when you, when you have that violent a change of your environment, you don't know what, it, what it's... But... <laughs> <laughs> we did a float trip on the Ganges, <laughs> and people were drinking that water, and I, I, di I, didn't, I didn't try that at all, no. Why did they want to move soda from the soda creek? Uh, soda spring to widen the highway. Oh, the highway, okay. It was, the soda spring was right close, and there was two lanes going out west of town. When they made that into four lanes, they moved the gazebo, and lost the spring. I mean, it's, I don't know, I think probably we could find it somehow, but you'd have to tear the highway up and <laughs> do all those things, and you know how city is about that kind of thing. I was just asking that all the money that you needed, could you, is there a possibility to have people restored things yeah. like that before? Yeah. yeah, I think you could. But you have to have enough people who want it want it you know and right now we're on a on a uh, designer water binge as you all know everybody has their mountain bike and is drinking water and I've just read last week where Seattle Washington which has an abundance of water uh, had funded a fifty thousand dollar study to bottle Seattle water tap water their city water because they have so much of it, and they thought they might as well make money out of it instead of just <laughs> keeping tourists away, you know. Uh, but uh, there is, you know, right now, I, I think uh, I was going over my notes from 10 years ago or so, and I said, sometime a gallon of water is going to cost more than a gallon of gas. Have you priced a gallon of water in the supermarket like this morning? It's about $5 a gallon. I'm not talking about distilled water, I'm talking about Calistoga water. It's about a dollar, dollar twenty for a liter. That translates into about five dollars a gallon, and um, gas is a dollar a gallon. So right now, water is more costly than gasoline. Who would have ever predicted that ten years ago? So. It's lost in there somewhere. It obviously, I think, now finds its way into the lake. So it's lost in the lake. You see bubbles coming up. They tried to put everything in the lake. They tunneled, 
No, they, they wanted to all in a central place because the idea is to get rid of it. These springs are troubles, Bill. They did, they did try to tie to, to make this I would like to add there is a there's kind of a price we pay for progress, but it's the steamboat spring from last night. But in its final years before the Silver Spring, when they tried to move it, its flow had diminished considerably. I used to collect water for it and make orange juice from the frozen country. But you had to make two trips. First you went out cleared out the dead leaves and twigs and cigarette butts and then you went back an hour later after it settled and collected your water. And these changes I think are caused by activities elsewhere. You build a road or dig a foundation that creates pressure, releases pressure, and disturbs things underground. And with all this with all the growth going on, uh, these springs are do change and are going to change. Yeah. The, 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 uh, so that the spring's days may have been numbered. Well, the, the, Moving it or not. Yeah, the, the flow was diminished after the first highway cut. I don't know whether you remember. Um, we remember in the late 50s when it just flowed out and everybody felt it was just like, a, like the other springs. But uh, when they first made that cut, and I think paved that road. They changed the road somewhat over on that side, and that must have been in the in the 60s. And then the the four lane thing came in 88, 89. There was still you're right that you could still fill your jug a little bit, but what it wasn't enough. You had to wait a long a long time. Um, the Iron Spring is still flowing, and still flows with a pretty good flow. It just depends that. The, it was unfortunate the gazebo was on that side and the highway cut it off, you see. That's, that was it. The other ones are on this side. Mm -hmm. If you know over by the steamboat spring, you kind of go back by the railroad tracks, a little pool in the water that are just like the spring. Is that the spring coming up in other places? Yeah. Because of the railroad? Well, yeah. The terrace spring, they call it a terrace spring, it, it flows out about a 20 foot section. If you look at it from the river, you see it just seeping out there. And you'll find it's cut a channel where it flows into the river. Uh, I've never drunk any of those springs. I've tried, I put the mud, I was fascinated when I saw people putting this on their skin. You know, that, that's from the, the ink spring, or that, that sulfur spring there. But they have cut a channel. As you can see where the railroad, where the steamboat spring was when they blasted that out and cut the tracks through. Oh, well, it's got a lot more sulfur in it. Well, you look at the chemical analysis, it's almost identical. And you'll see the chemical analysis of even of the pool has lithia in it. I mean, our, 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 our heart spring has some lithia in it. How, how much does the, does the temperature of these springs vary? Does it list that in there? 73 for sulfur spring, 72 for the lithium. That shouldn't be it. Usually when you warm it up, that's why I, if you take the lithium and put it in your refrigerator and chill it down, the sulfur disappears because the sulfur gas comes up, you know, at about room temperature. I mean, it, it evaporates. One of the biggest differences is the level of arsenic. <laughs> 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 yeah. Arsenic is a cure for cancer. That's what they. <laughs> Any other questions, Jay? George, there's ice cream people gathering water from the spring on West 40, over by where John Isles used to live. Yeah. Can you tell me something about that spring? I've drunk the water from there. I mean, it's good water. It, yeah, it just comes out of the rock. There, there are lots of springs around. Uh, probably one of the best tasting ones I've ever tasted was I did a lot of, I, I'm a water dowser, and I did a lot of work for Milligan up Elk River. And when they put that highway, they paved the highway in front of his ranch. He's since sold it, I guess, Bill. And uh, he discovered a, a, 
a spring, and it was a marvelous spring, but the highway department couldn't pave the road. So uh, I had to go out and douse where the spring came out of the rock, and then they piped it over to where Milligan's barn is. And that has enough pressure to run, run his uh, sprinkler. Every time I go up there, I fill my jug, and it is the finest water I've ever. It's, there's no pressure. It just comes out of there. It goes under the highway now. It's an RT. It, 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 it is a beautiful spring. Yeah. They, you know, I douse about a hundred wells a, a, a summer, and I get always get some artesians, and it just whoosh, just comes in. Some of them up one by Steamboat Lake at 150 gallons a minute, so they really flow. They're all springs, but you daylight them when you drill them. That's 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 the thing. Any other questions? Well, okay. You said you douse douse the water. Uh, yes. What is your technique? Is it Something anyone could do. Or... Willow stick, you know. I have fancy rods, fiberglass, the divining rods, and fancy brass and copper L rods, but the bent coat hanger works just as well. <laughs> so there's a great. We we uh, we live in a in a water short area, and maybe that's the reason these springs are so prized. You know, it, it bothers me now when people want 20 gallons a minute for an indoor swimming pool because we live in a, in a water short area, you know, and, and the water is precious. So it's, uh, it's something we all have to conserve. All over. That's right. Except Seattle. Except Seattle. <laughs> we'll all be drinking Seattle water. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Oh, no. Can you find one to take oh, you have another one. I'll Yeah, about, uh, they change about as frequently underground as they do on top of the ground, which means uh, every 30 days, depending on the season where there's a lot of runoff, uh, they, they wander around. They go through different fissures, and that's what was Bill was saying. Sometimes the, strings, the, the springs will dry up by themselves. Uh, a lot of times if I find a spring to develop for water, uh, it'll last five years. And then suddenly, I'll get a call, and they said, there's no water this morning. And I can't find it. It's gone. Maybe somebody 20 miles away is cut in there, Bill. So I'm often amused with misinformation put out to the effect that Steamboat Springs is 150 hot springs. That's a lot of hot springs. I think we can loosely define a hot spring as anything above normal body temperature. And with that definition, we have only the two, Strawberry Park and Steam of Health and Rail. Unless anyone knows of any others. <laughs> there are a lot of them up on Buffalo, on, uh, it's up Strawberry Park, though. I mean, there's not just the ones feeding them, because I've doused a lot of them, and we've had hot water all along that road. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that, and that uh, I think that comes off of Crystal, Crystal Peak up there. Uh, as I said, Hans Peak is a very young volcano. So from what Bill Bo says, that water comes up from 3,000 feet down and then flows down this way. We have about uh, oh, six or seven uh, separate streams coming into the heart pool at the, at the swimming pool. So they kind of curve around the mountain and come in this way and this way. And I'm always holding my breath when we have another construction project that we're going to lose the big one. How do you doubt? Oh, that's another lecture. <laughs> uh, okay. I think we're up. Okay. Yeah. So thank you very much. <laughs>